First of all, Happy New Year. My name is Paul Yorkus, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the Middlesex, Norfolk, and Worcester Democratic Alliance. The Alliance meets once per month, usually on the first Monday, and brings together people to gain a better understanding of the ideas, issues, and candidates. The Alliance does not endorse candidates in primary elections. Finally, there's a very important group of voters, um, and I would like to ask that all the people who will be voting in November 2012 for the first time to please stand. Yes. Oh. All right. Yeah. much. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for uh, the very generous introduction. And thank you to everybody who made this possible. Um, thank you, Kathleen, for leading us. Uh, I, I understand your point, Paul, and it's really the right place to start. It takes a lot of people to pull an event like this together. It takes a lot of people to run for office and to win an election. And I'm here tonight for exactly that reason. I'm here to ask for help. So I thought maybe how we'd do this, I'd spend a little time. I'm just going to tell you my story. Uh, some of you have already heard it. I hope it doesn't get boring on repetition, but it's a key part of what this is about. And I'll tell you about that and tell you about why I got drawn into this race. And then at the end, I promise, I'm going to ask you again for some help. And then we'll just take questions and answers so that I'm sure I'm talking about the things that are most interesting to you as we do this. Um, I, Start this always by explaining to people, I've been talking about middle class families uh, really all of my adult life and professional life. And a large part of that is because I grew up in a family that was kind of hanging on to its place in the middle class pretty much by its fingernails. We had, my dad worked hard all my life like a lot of people. And we had some good years and we had some bad years. Uh, my father sold fencing. He sold carpeting. He ended up as a maintenance man. 
Um, we, we did okay most years. Um, when I was in junior high, he had a heart attack. And uh, the combination of the time off work and the medical bills meant we lost the family car. And uh, my mom went to work at Sears answering the phones so that we would be able to make the mortgage payments and hang on to the house. Um, I have three much older brothers. I was the one who came along later. It actually didn't occur to me quite what a surprise I was <laughs> until I was much, much older. You know, it's those things that hit you that, hmm, maybe at 40 they weren't looking for another baby. Uh, but, uh, uh, so they had the, the boys first, and they, that's how my three brothers are always referred to in our family, the boys. And in many ways, between the four of us, I guess, we are kind of America's story. All three of my brothers served in the military. Uh, my uh, oldest brother, Don, uh, stayed in his career in the military. He did 288 combat missions in Vietnam, um, something that everybody in the family is really proud of. Uh, my second brother, John, worked construction all his life, um, sometimes just with a hammer and sometimes uh, with a shovel. And for 10 years during his working years, he was able to get a good union job uh, operating a crane. Um, I have to say all of that is very hard work out there. Um, and my third brother, uh, David, he was the one in the family with the special spark. Uh, everybody still, David, David's the lively one in the family. You should meet David sometime. Uh, <laughs> David is the one who started a small business, uh, and when that one didn't work out, he started another one. Uh, because David's one of those people that could not imagine a world in which he wasn't out there trying to live by his wits. And uh, those are my three brothers. I, um, I started working young. I got my first job when I was nine. It was not the Newt Gingrich plan. <laughs> um, instead, it was uh, totally opportunistic. This is, you'll, you'll find this is a major theme, I think, in my life. Um, the family across the street had a new baby. The new baby had colic, and I was in business. Uh, <laughs> For 35 cents an hour, I would rock that baby all night long. Uh, and uh, everyone was happy about that. Um, I started uh, waiting tables when I was 13. And I got married when I was 19. Um, I graduated from a public university. And I never say that without stopping and saying, can we hear it for public universities? God bless. Yes. I love it. And after I graduated, I started teaching um, elementary school. I taught special needs kids. And I want to hear it for public school teachers. Uh, salt of the earth. I had my first baby when I was 22, my daughter Amelia, who just got on a plane a little while ago with our three grandchildren, uh, how the life, uh, the circle goes. Uh, Amelia was born when I was 22, and here's where the big switch comes in my life. When I was 24, I hauled off and did something I had never expected to do. I decided to go to law school. And um, so uh, I was living in New Jersey. I'm married. I have this little baby. To go to law school, I had to do, I had to be able to arrange to pay tuition. I went to a state school, so tuition was low, but it was still something. And I also had to pay for child care. Um, and there was a big price break, depending on whether you had a potty trained child, in which case the price was here, or a not potty trained child, in which case the price was much more substantial. So it was critical. My first day of law school was literally Amelia's second birthday. So what was critical is I moved the birthday party back one day, but I had to get Amelia completely potty trained, reliably potty trained. Those were the words used back then. By the time she was two years old, so all I can say is I am here today courtesy of three bags of M&Ms. If it had not been for that, my whole life would have been off in some other direction. Um, working parents everywhere understand this. Amelia also does not appreciate this story. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I went to law school. I loved law school. I had enormous fun in law school. Uh, but I graduated from law school nine months pregnant. I was still family and all things woven together. Uh, since I was nine months pregnant, I was also 100% unemployable. And so, uh, you know, but you do what you can. You work with what you got. So I was eligible to take the bar exam. 
I took the bar, I hung out a shingle, and I practiced law out of my living room. Um, it, I can say it was an adventure with two small children, uh, only one of whom was body trained. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I did that for a while, but before very long, I went back to my first love. My first love is teaching. Um, and I traded. I traded the little kids from elementary school that I'd been teaching for the bigger kids from law school. And I taught at five different universities around the country. And that's when I started doing my research, really around the economics of the family and the economic survival of America's families and what was happening to America's middle class. So I taught around the country at different places. And almost 20 years ago, um, I moved to Massachusetts. Now, I moved to Massachusetts for two reasons. The first is that my husband's family is from here. Uh, his mom and dad were still alive then, and it meant we could live near them. Uh, also, his brother and sister are here, his sister's family. So all of the family on that side was here, and it was important to us to be able to live near family. The other reason is I got a great job offer. And uh, that's the reason a lot of people move to Massachusetts, a uh, really good job offer. But for me, it is the arc of a story, because the way I think about this is the daughter of a maintenance man who ended up as a fancy pants professor at Harvard Law School. <laughs> America is truly a great country. Um, <laughs> it's true. this story for two reasons. I tell this story, one reason, is because if I'm going to ask you to let me represent you in Washington, given all that's going on right now, I think you have a right to know something about my heart, about how I grew up and what I care about and what's important to me. But I tell the story for a second reason. And the second reason is because it is a story embedded in time. I grew up in an America that was investing heavily in kids like me. I grew up in an America that believed in opportunity, 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 even for a kid who was the daughter of a maintenance man. And this is how I see that story. It really started pretty much long before I was born. It starts during the Great Depression. Think about this time. It's a time you know, that's so dark for America. We are so worried about our future at this point, worried whether we even have a future as a country and as a people. And coming out of the Great Depression, we make two critical decisions as a country that shape who we are as a people and shape the kind of country we become. The first has to do with the importance of rules. You know, prior to the Great Depression, if you look back at America's economic history, you see this, it's just a boom-bust cycle. Uh, the economy starts to grow, it's starting to look pretty good, and then there is, you remember what they were called? We, I, I know I have at least one history teacher here. Financial panics. And there'd be a panic, and it would wipe out the banks. Uh, it would wipe out the speculators, but it would also wipe out businesses, it would wipe out uh, farmers. It wiped out a lot of folks, indiscriminately. And then people would try to put things back together, and off we'd go again. Now, there are a lot of people who thought that's just a natural phenomenon. It's like weather. It gets cold in the winter and hot in the summer. It just works on roughly on cycles. Roughly about every 15 years this happens. In the United States, we made the decision coming out of the Great Depression, no, this is not something that just happens. It has to do with rules. And when you put some basic rules in place, you know, just like having referees in a basketball game, you get some basic rules in place, you level the playing field, so everybody has a chance. You get some transparency in it. By golly, you can stop that part of the boom-bust cycle, the idea that you're just going to have financial collapses. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. We passed three basic laws. FDIC insurance, make it safe to put money in banks. Glass-Steagall, make banking boring. Uh, <laughs> If you want to have a big time, you know, you do not write down the numbers in the bathrooms. For a good time, call your local bank. Mm. No, nope, no, nope. banking is supposed to be boring. And the third one was put a real cop on the beat for the SEC. So when you're out there doing that stock trading, there's some basic transparency, some fair rules. And you know what? Here's the thing. It worked for us for more than half a century. We basically have no 
financial panics or bank systemic bank failures for more than half a century. In other words, rules matter. You put rules in place, you put a cop on the beat to enforce them, and you get some real transparency in that system, and you take that, build it up, and then crash it out of the system. So that's number one. And by the way, it did work until the 1980s, and we start deregulating, start pulling the threads out of the regulation. And what happens? Late 1980s, we get the savings and loan crisis. Late 1990s, we get long-term capital management crisis, remember, around the world. And then, of course, 2008, we get the big crash. Um, but the point is, we learned something. We learned that it is possible to put rules in place that govern even the most powerful companies and that create an opportunity for prosperity for all of us. Regulation works. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's an even more remarkable decision that we made as a country, and that was the decision that we would invest in ourselves. We would invest in our future and in our kids' future. And think how we did that. The first one was through education. We put money big time into public education. If you think of that whole arc, that half century afterwards, you really can start at Head Start. We did Head Start, we put more money into the elementary schools, into the junior highs, into the high schools, into community colleges, into our public universities, into our graduate schools. A grateful nation said to returning GIs after World War II, we will pay for you to get a college education or advanced technical training. God bless, that's right. That's exactly right. And you know, I wouldn't be a teacher if I didn't point out for every dollar we put in, most research now shows we got $5 back. We got more productivity, we got higher taxes paid by people who got a better education. America, 1950s, late 1950s, who were the first folks in space, remember? Not us, it was the Soviets. A shocking moment for America that we were not leading in the space race. So what was our response? We needed to invest more in our kids' education. As a country, we passed the NDEA, National Defense Education Act, and I'm a product of that act, because what it said was the United States government will lend money to any kid who wants to go to college, and here was the best part. It wasn't just in the lending business, it said if you'll work in certain critical industries, math, sciences, engineering, teaching special needs kids, if you'll work in certain critical industries, we will forgive 15% of the principal and all of the interest every year that you're working in. In a handful of years, your loans will be paid off because we want to make that investment in you. It was NDEA that let me go to college, and I will forever be grateful for that. So we invested in education. I'll mention the others quickly. We invested in infrastructure. We built the national highway system at this point. We invested in mass transit. We had the core of the T, for example, here. But this is when we expanded it out and started doing it in more places around the country. Why? Because we wanted more people to be able to get to jobs wherever you lived. Because we wanted more people to be able to build businesses and know that workers could get to them, know that customers could get to them. We invested in rail, we invested in a transportation system, we invested in water and sewage, all the things it takes to keep something going. We invested in power. We built a national power grid during this time. Now, it was based on 20th century power, on fossil fuel, because that was the best that we knew. But our underlying assumption was, we don't know what cool idea you're going to come up with. We don't know what great idea for a business you're going to come up with, but we're pretty darn sure you're going to need to plug in when you get it. That's what it's going to take to keep it going, and that's what we provide. That's what we do collectively. That's what the government does, is that it builds that power grid so anybody who's got a great idea can plug that idea in. And I should say, we invested in research. You know, we invested big time in research. We put money into our universities to get them to do the research. The government did research. Private entities did research. Why did we invest so heavily in research? Because we understood as a country this was our competitive advantage. 
the idea that we would be on the cutting edge, we come up with the new ideas, the innovations, the ways to do something differently, that was going to be our comparative advantage. We made those investments, and those investments worked. For half a century, you watch as America's GDP grows, America's median family income grows. The fully employed male, best apples to apples comparison you can make, adjusted for inflation year after year. Income is going up as, in, as GDP is going up for the whole country. Or to say it another way, as we all got better off, we all got better off. That was the real difference. And then, about a generation ago, starting in the 80s, we really lost our way. We turned in a different direction. Incomes start to flatten. Core expenses, housing, health care, transportation, child care, the cost to send someone to college, all those start going through the roof. And families are caught in the squeeze. What happens? We deregulated the consumer credit industry so they could paint a bullseye on anybody's backside. So money starts getting drained away there, and families start loading up more and more on debt. So we see by the boom times of the 2000s, not post-crash, but by the boom times of the 2000s, we're watching what's happened to families. That one-income family back in the 70s that used to be able to put away 11% of their take-home pay that they could put away in savings switched over effectively to zero. Instead, what we see are families that are loading up on debt that exceeds their income. We reach a point where about a million and a half families, middle class families as measured by education, by occupation, by um, home ownership, are filing for bankruptcy on an annual basis. More likely, there's a point in the, in the 2000s, more likely that a child will live through her parents' bankruptcy than through her parents' divorce. That's how often it's coming along. We turn into a country that shifts in other ways as well. China now, investing 9% of its GDP in infrastructure. Europe, older economies, developing five, uh, investing 5% of their GDP in infrastructure. The United States, 2.4% and trying to figure out how to cut it. At 2.4%, you don't keep this country going, much less moving ahead. That's the kind of country we shifted into. And then this summer, that's when you really saw it all this summer. We were in this debate about what are we going to do about a $14 trillion deficit, and that is a scary, scary thing. But one newspaper article summarized it all. Didn't link the pieces up, but boy, they linked up in my mind. Three things. The first one, General Electric. That was the example used, but you could have picked plenty of others. A profitable international corporation located here in the United States pays nothing, zero in taxes, perfectly legally, pays zero in taxes, while those in Washington are saying none, none of those loopholes are on the table to be cut. They get to continue to pay zero in taxes at the same moment that we will say to young people, you've got to take on more debt in order to get an education. And we're saying to seniors, you may have to learn to live on less. I'll tell you, that was a real moment for me. Because you know how I saw that? That is not a question of finance. That is not a question of economics. That is a question of values. Yes! as a people and what kind of country we are going to build. And that is exactly why I am in this race now. I see this as a choice, a choice about what kind of people we are and what kind of country we are going to build. I do roll into this. Are we a country that has decided? Um, we believe. Uh, I got mine, and the rest of you are on your own. Is that the kind of country that we want to be? Or are we a country that believes? We love success. We celebrate success. We say that when you succeed, enjoy it. 
revel in it, roll in it. But you've got to take a piece of it, and you've got to be willing to invest it forward so that we have all the right conditions in place, education, infrastructure, power, uh, research, so the next kid who has a good idea can make it big, and the kid after that, and the kid after that. pretty obvious why it is that I got in this race. Um, I never thought I would run for elective office. I know what I care about. I always thought my job was to play a different role in this, to try to help, to offer the research, to speak up, to be independent about it. And somehow, it all came together here, because this is the time and this is the set of issues. I am here tonight in part to honor my mother and father. They're both gone now, but they worked so hard all their lives that they believed, they believed down to their toes that America was a place of opportunity. And they worked hard knowing, knowing their kids were going to do better than they did. I am here in part to run on exactly their ideals. And the second half of why I'm here are those three little kids that just got on an airplane who were with us over the holidays, our three grandchildren. I think a lot about the world they're going to grow up in. And I believe to my toes that what they deserve is they deserve a world that is as full of opportunity as the world that I grew up in. So I understand this as America was never perfect. Um, there were a lot of people. You look back, the 1950s, uh, women were not welcome in lots of places and in lots of jobs and lots of opportunities that were cut off. African Americans were certainly not welcome. Um, Latinos. Uh -huh. um, there was a lot. A lot of folks who were shut out. But here's the difference. We so believed in opportunity that the arc moved in the right direction. It was always toward expanding those opportunities. It was toward making more available to more of us. That's what it was about. It was about investing in our future. So I'm here tonight to ask you for exactly that. I don't want America to be a country in which it's all about, I got mine and the rest of you are on your own. I want us to be a country that says, I really believe an opportunity. I know it's hard. I know we have to work for it. I know we have to invest in it. But I know it is possible. Running for office is a real act of optimism. It's, um, you stand on the edge and you say, I'm just going to jump off and flap my wings as hard as I can, <laughs> work as hard as I can, and count on the fact that I will not be alone in this. I'm here tonight with the people who really make something happen. Many of the people in this room, I realize, have been out here doing this for 10 years, 20 years. I think I've got some who are hitting the 30 and 40 year marks. And we've also got some new voters first time around. The only way we build an America of opportunity is if we do it tonight, together. And so I ask you tonight, if you really believe that we can do this, if you really care about whether or not we do this, then I ask you, join this campaign, and let's make it happen. We're going to do it in 2012.